Good evening everyone, welcome to our June 2nd, 2012 uh, concert of South Bay Youth Orchestra, Londale String Ensembles and Palos Verdes uh, Strings. And this is the pre-concert lecture in which I am very excited and honored to have with us Mr. Mark Luther, who is our conductor's father, Cosima's father, Cosima Luther. And I'm very excited about this because I met Cosima about three years ago and uh, I met her because she agreed to come and play for a group of preschoolers and the moment I met her I was just uh, very impressed. Of course she's a very talented young lady and her charm, her warmth is just uh, very captivating. And shortly after that I met her brother Chris and well, basically, uh, same thing. It's a, he's a very talented young man, a very accomplished a string player, and also a great person to, to talk to. And so immediately I realized, well, there has to be a family environment behind uh, people like this. And so I have asked Mr. Mark Luther, their father, to please share with us uh, how he was able to uh, create a musical environment and if, if on purpose he used music to help him raise his family. And uh, also, Mr. Luther happens to have started a 14-year-old tradition, which is the Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp. And I look forward to attending this camp in the future when my children are a little more accomplished and more of age, so that uh, we can play some fiddle music. Uh, it's a, an important uh, valuable American tradition and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from uh, Mr. Luther. Let's go. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much Mariano and thank you to my daughter Cosima who's uh, conducting these events today uh, for allowing me to come. I am extremely flattered and Mariano said a lot of what I might have said in my introduction so I'm not going to start talking a lot right now. I will talk uh, and uh, we'll conduct this discussion on how to raise kids as musicians, which I know you're interested in, and uh, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But part of music is to have great music, and I'm going to ask the Murphy Family Band to play a number for us right now to get us off to a great start, and then I'll start talking more about that. So please. seeing more of them 
Now, so what do they have to do with what I'm here to talk about? Well, almost everything. Uh, by coincidence, uh, I am lucky enough to have two children, and they are a son and daughter, as Mario said, uh, Mariana, sorry, and, uh, and the Murphys, as you can see, have a son and a daughter. And the Murphys have been coming to Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp since 2005 as a family. So you can ask them later on if you want. I'm not going to have them give a testimonial, but they can describe to you what it's meant to them. And uh, Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp, I have to put in my plug early. It, we're found on the web. You can Google us. It, the website is uh, www.rmfiddle.com. And we hope you'll take a look at it uh, to, uh, to see if you want to come with your family. Um, I'll qualify myself first. Uh, again, Mariano gave such a great introduction, but my two kids, which are a lot like them, uh, but a generation or so, not quite a generation older. My kids are 29 and 27, but I'll call them kids all my life. And uh, uh, Christopher, my son, is just finishing up his doctoral degree in viola performance. And Cosma, as you know, conducts here. Uh, they each have a parallel. They went to school together, a master's degree from uh, USC. And uh, so the music kind of worked out, and uh, obviously far more than I had hoped. But uh, it was uh, not so long ago when I was uh, a parent just like all of you. And is this going to work? Is this a good thing I want to do for my kids? Uh, is it worth the effort? Is it worth the effort for me? Is it worth it for them? Will it stick? And uh, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, I'm going to tell you what I did in raising my kids. And I did a lot. I've been reflecting on this. I don't want you to think, oh, I can never do everything that Mark Luther did. If you can just pick up one or two ideas from this discussion and it improves your kids' musical appreciation or devotion, that's great. So I'm going to tell you lots of stuff. And please, don't, don't get discouraged by it, um, but I was devoted to it. I will be watching my watch. I'll talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll have some questions and we'll be done here by 6.45. Uh, I boiled it down to two words as parents. What you need, intention and involvement. And I mean parental intention and parental involvement. And I've heard different points of view about this and I have Again, I'm, I'm going to get into parenting a little bit because I was invited to, because parenting is a big part of raising a musician. Um, kids don't know what they want to do. I've heard parents tell me or say to me, oh, I might raise my children playing music or I don't know if that's what they're going to want to do or something. Um, when I was first asked, and the answer has never changed, when I was first asked, when did you realize your kids wanted to be violinists? My answer was instantly, before they were born. Now, that could be interpreted as me being authoritarian or forcing them into a narrow slot. Not at all, but it was my intention. Imagine asking a three or four year old, okay, but before I get to this, first of all, what do we want for our kids? Well. Top priority is obviously their health, safety, and happiness. What's the next step? Well, we'd like them to accomplish something. We'd like them to be proud of what they can do. And there are thousands, millions of ways to do that. But you can't ask a three or four year old, would you like to become an Olympic figure skater? Or would you like to become a world-class tennis pro? Or maybe a great golfer or an orchestral musician? They don't know. So I put parental intention as the most important thing, but not most important, along with then involvement. You have to buy into this. But remember, you're the parent. And again, this is my point of view. I know people have other points of view, so I'm, I'm not advocating. I'm just espousing what, what worked in our family. Uh, they don't know what they want. And it's your job to guide them, but you need to guide them making it as fun as possible, as nice as possible. You induce them. 
Um, Mariano asked me what role discipline has to play, and I'll mention that a little bit, but discipline should be almost the last step. It's things that you can do to motivate it, to make it fun. Well, the first thing is your involvement. Hey, I'm dad, I'm here, let's practice, let's do this together. Now, involvement, going off and practicing for a second, means you go to their lessons. You, you, you just have to. Fortunately, I raised my kids in Suzuki, and I had learned that Suzuki requires parental involvement. And um, I was lucky enough to take music lessons as a kid, and I was a piano player, and then I majored in church organ in college, and that's when I first heard about Suzuki. So when I was getting to the age where I was now married and the kids were on the horizon, I took up violin and studied it very seriously for two years at age 28. So again, I'm not saying you have to do that, but then when it was time to take the kids to their lessons, and it was time to put bow on string, I understood what that meant. And so I could coach them with that. But you can't say to a kid, uh, go practice for 15 minutes and then come back and have dinner. Kid, they don't know how to practice. You need to say, we're gonna practice now. Let's go practice. And I remember uh, my little boy Christopher, who's obviously full grown by now, uh, one fun thing I would do, would do, we had a nice pedestal table and I could put him up right at it so we were eye to eye and, uh, you know, work through what he was supposed to practice. And always trying to make it fun, trying to make it interesting. Another example of motivating kids, part of Suzuki lessons is uh, group lessons. If you're in a good Suzuki program, and again, that's not the only way to go. There are plenty of ways to raise musical kids. I was strict Suzuki, or my kids were strict Suzuki, and so I'm a big believer in it. It worked out as well as it did. But uh, part of Suzuki is group lessons. So every Saturday morning we had group lessons. Okay, well, how many kids want to get up and go to group lessons on Saturday morning? Luckily, our route to and from the group lessons went right by the 7-Eleven store. So, very soon, I can't remember when it started, it was such a tradition. Hey kids, we're going home from group lesson, let's stop by 7-Eleven, pick out anything you want. Anything you want, you know, uh, candy bar, Skittles, M&Ms, and so that was such a habit that when they woke up on Saturday morning, it wasn't oh, it's group lesson day, it was, oh, I get to go to 7-Eleven. So you see, it's a motivator. Make it, make it good. And I use that phrase a lot with my kids. Good things for good kids. If you, do, if you behave well, if you do good things for me, I'm going to do good things for you. So it's, it's a positive thing. It's a, it's a, a whole bunch of incentives. And um, another great tip on practicing that uh, I learned from our teacher, for example, is if you're in Suzuki, after you get through book two or three, you start reviewing the pieces you learned in book one and two, because it, it's a very good program that way. And uh, she made a suggestion that uh, you write the names of these pieces that they've learned two or three years ago on a little piece of paper, and put them in a little basket, and then pick out a tune. So practicing became a fun little game. Okay, pick another one. Oh, okay, now you gotta play it. Okay, well, I have to play it. They're going along with the game. So um, that's important, I think, in terms of that. Now, somewhere along the line, I realized that it had to be fun. And I'm, I've got two steps away from getting to Rock, Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp in, uh, in a moment. Uh, part of my motivation, although I had known even prior to this that I was hoping I could raise my kids as musicians, how many of you, for example, and I'm one of these, did take lessons as a child and dropped it for whatever reason, and then somewhere in your adulthood uh, thought, oh gosh, if I'd only stuck with it. Anyway, I'll volunteer. So I knew it took a lot of uh, motivation. And we had an event, it's uh, still there, in Colorado. We grew up in Denver, Colorado, uh, called the Colorado Renaissance Festival. And I remember going there long before I had kids. We had a family connection. 
and they have street musicians. And there was a little boy playing fiddle for chips. And I thought, I wonder if I'll ever have a child who does that. Well, again, with my intention, once Christopher, at age eight, had learned just a few fiddle tunes, not Suzuki tunes, although we could use those, but I also introduced him to what I call fiddle tunes. We'll hear some more of those in a moment. Uh, we went and we auditioned for the Colorado Renaissance Festival. They advertised for street musicians for auditioning. We went and auditioned. We got accepted. It was amazing to me. Uh, but we were, and the music director there said, well, you need to learn more Scottish and Irish tunes. I think the only Irish tune we had was Irish Washerwoman. So I'm going to take a break now and show you what you can learn at Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp uh, if you raise a Suzuki kid. And then I'll also talk about what adults can do. Now, uh, Sarah Murphy has agreed to join me because uh, my daughter Cosima, who might normally join me for something like this, obviously has a lot on her mind right now. Uh, so Sarah, did I mention this, has been coming to Fiddle Camp since 2005, about eight years. So uh, as a little girl, and uh, but for the year difference, uh, the, the parallels are, are amazing. So give us a little sample of uh, Suzuki Kid playing Twinkles, please. You want me to do the... Yeah, the pepperoni pizza or whatever. We have a version of that in the fiddle world. It's called Bile the Cabbage, about the same level. That's it. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're a little tight here. Um, your kids will learn that in less than a week if they come to Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp. If they're experienced players, they'll probably learn it in about 10 minutes. Maybe they could learn it 10 minutes here. But I want to mention that grown-ups can come to Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp too. In fact, we encourage it. And as you'll see, if you've already seen with the Mercy Murphy family, and if we had a keyboard here, you'd see it with me, um, music should be a family event. It shouldn't be something you kid or you so-and-so go over there and do it. It's let's do it. Let's do it. And that I think is so important too. So um, thanks sir. That's enough for now for a minute or two. Uh, so the Colorado Renaissance Festival, one great thing about that that I know you probably can't reproduce but I don't want to discourage it is that uh, Christopher, we dress him up in a little Robin Hood kind of costume, and I dressed in a costume to look the part, and I could play, uh, I learned a few chords on mandolin, nowhere close to what uh, Kyle could play on mandolin. And we'd go there, and he'd play for tips. Well, imagine what a kid feels like when people are throwing money at him. Not literally throwing, but putting it down on this little basket in front of him. and. Uh, that's a huge motivator. Now, you may not have a Renaissance Festival, and you may not be able to do all of that, but if, if you have children interested in that, uh, I know other kids who've gone to shopping malls or just a busy street corner on a, uh, a street fair or something like that. So usually you have to get permission or something, but uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's the greatest motivator there is. And little Christopher, the Renaissance Festival was over June and July, and of course July 4th is in there. And uh, so with his, his wad of cash, which was a lot for a little eight or nine year old, I'd take him to the fireworks store and he would just swagger up and down the aisles uh, picking out whatever he wanted because he earned the money. So that, that's one thing that happened in our lives and, and we did that for uh, nine years until they got too big. He didn't look that great being my size in a little Robin Hood outfit. <laughs> but uh, somewhere in there, someone said we should learn Scottish and Irish tunes, and that was good advice. And I found a teacher in Denver who did teach uh, Scottish, and she's very good. 
And she said to me, as I brought the kids, uh, you should take them to this fiddle camp out in California. And I remember my reaction, and it was, that's crazy. Who in the world would take a week out of their life and spend a lot of money to go to a fiddle camp? And that literally was my first reaction. But circumstances occurred such that we did go to that camp. And it was in 1995, and we had a great time. And I'll talk more about why it was a great time, but I'll finish this narration. Uh, I turned to the kids towards the end of the week. I said, kids, is this great? We should do this every year. Yes, Dad, this is so great. We'll do it every year. Well, this camp is oversubscribed. And good for them. It's a very popular, successful camp. And the next year, we didn't get in. They hold a lottery. And that's when I got the idea. I said to my kids, I'd like to bring you to camp every year, and I can't do it here. So that is the beginning of the inspiration for Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp. How can I always have a camp to bring my kids? I guess I've got to start one myself. So we started Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp. Our first year was 1999. We, uh, this will be, as uh, was mentioned, uh, our 14th year. If you corresponded with me, which you're very welcome to do in emails and things, I'll, uh, you'll see that in the, the, the signature. And actually, I'll put in the plug. If you go find the website, click on Join Email List, and you'll get our monthly newsletter. All the information is there. And uh, so I hope you'll do that. So that's how we got it started. But it wasn't, and I, I hate to contradict you, Mariano, but it wasn't to preserve the fiddle tradition. What it was for is to show kids that playing your instrument is fun. Because Suzuki lessons and school lessons and orchestra and all of that just doesn't convey how much fun it really is. But you go to fiddle camp and you see people play the way you see the Murphy family play and you join them and it's, it's a very warm environment too. Unlike school, you know, you think of school and kids are always conscious of who's in which grade and I'm in a higher grade and you're in a lower grade and all that. It, all those lines are blurred at fiddle camp. If, you, uh, if you're there and you're playing, you can join any group of people and no matter how old or young they are, um, you can play along with them. And so we have organized classes and then we have organized jams and then uh, concerts and dances. It's a very full week. And then after all the scheduled things, the kids and the adults stay up another three to six hours playing music all night long. So Sarah, I'm gonna ask you to play another fiddle tune for us, a little more advanced than uh, Boil with Cabbage. <coughs> That'd be great. one more time before I'm done. Uh, a couple of the points that were asked to me is, is what role discipline does play? Um, again, while I, I'm a firm believer that the parents in charge, it's, it's not a two-way street raising a kid. It's the parent, you're in charge, I think you're entitled to be, you're providing, you brought them into the world, you're providing clothing, food, uh, nourishment, housing, you have the right to steer them <coughs> to the extent you choose to and to the extent you can make it happy for them and good for them. Um, but practicing on a day-to-day -day basis is kind of a negotiated thing. One comment I would, uh, one thing I would do frequently is uh, say, okay, time to practice. I don't want to practice now. 
Okay, when do you want to practice? Look at the clock, name a time. So they felt they had a little bit of influence over that. They could choose the time. Now when that time came along, okay, now it's time, end of discussion, here we go. Uh, another one, my son has told some of his uh, uh, co-musicians, uh, I presume he tells it fondly, is uh, if we get towards the end of the day and it's time to practice, I'm too tired to practice. And I'd say, okay, it's time for bed. I don't want to go to bed. Well, if you're not going to bed, you're going to practice. That's the, that's the choice. If you're too tired, it's time for bed. It's, uh, or you practice. But again, always trying to make it something fun. And again, that's what, what Fiddle Camp uh, does. It plays a great role. And, and obviously, to this day, I recommend a, a good uh, classical training because it gives you the tools. And I've learned a lot, too, about how this works. And I can't say all of it. But make it fun. Make it rewarding. Make it something they want to do. I'm running a little short of time, so I'm going to stop with my remarks and ask if there are any questions. Yes? So the fiddle camp is in California? No, it's in uh, Colorado. We grew up in Denver, and so that's where I started it. I've since moved to California, but it's called Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp. You fly into Denver, which is actually a pretty convenient flight from anywhere because we have a big airport there, and we'd have a bus that will take you up to the camp. and. Uh, Without naming prices, I'm told it's actually a pretty reasonable one-week vacation. Room and board, classes and events, uh, and the learning experience is, is as good as I can describe it. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. The camp ongoing all of this summer? No, no. It's only one week. This, this year it's August 5 through 12. And I do have to say, with all of my talking about it, that we're almost sold out. So while I encourage any and all of you to go online tonight, and you could you could even register today if you wanted to. Yeah, I forgot to tell him. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I know where. <it's> <laughs> anyway, um, I can't guarantee at this point you'll get in this year, but we're every year, and and it's a, it's first come first serve. I told you my lottery experience, so I do not run a lottery. If you want to come to Phil Camp. Next year, you can sign up and you'll get into Fiddle Camp next year. I can't be sure about this year, but I, won't, I don't want to discourage you. I just feel I have to say that. Any other questions? Yes? How old would a child or how young would a child would be to appreciate it, to make it? Okay, that's a great question. Well, I would say uh, as early as age four. I mean, I do allow three and under for free, so I don't expect them to come to class. Age four, again with parental involvement. Now you'd have to lead your four-year-old around to various classes and, and get them to their meals on time. By the time they're 10 or 12, again, it's a, a, such a safe, benign environment. You know, it's a great place to, to say, okay, kid, you're off to class, I'll see you at dinner. And they'll find their way around. But, but real young, you'd have to do that. Now we do have great teachers for youngsters, uh, Suzuki trained, uh, teachers for beginners and again it's not a kids camp it's for kids of all ages as I say our oldest camper for all 14 years has been my mother and uh, she's gonna be in her 90s I'll, I'll say it that way and we get we uh, one great camper was a, a doctor who retired at age 65 he said I woke up after retiring decided I want to become a fiddler and so he took it up then and we offer other instruments besides fiddle. Um, violin, I think, is actually a fairly challenging instrument. But piano, guitar, mandolin, of course, they're all challenging if you get as good as the Murphys are. Um, but I, I often get parents saying, well, I have to come because I'm bringing a kid. And I'll respond saying, well, that's great. But why don't you think about taking up something? Why don't you think about going to a piano class or a guitar class so that eventually the two of you can play together. <coughs> Excuse me. Other questions? Oh, are they going to play during the concert? No, they're going to play right now in a moment. The kids can't see them then. Yes. Um, is, the, is the camp you have actually like cabins or are they? It's actually, we've, we've been in three or four different locations and right now we're at what you could best call a mountain resort. It's called Snow Mountain Ranch, if any of you know Colorado. 
and uh, it's about two hours outside of Denver, and um, we stay in a, a hotel-like lodge. Um, back when I go into details, the, each room is house of six people, and if there's two or three of you, you might be with another family of two or three. Um, and then we have a central dining hall. All meals are prepared for us, so you don't have to lose any time doing that. And as I say, we, we fill the whole day with, with classes. Are those classes held inside or outside rooms or in the... They're, they're usually inside. Occasionally they might be outside or in a tent or something. But it, it, it's, it's conducive. I mean, it's a camp, but it's not. I just wondering if you can't be cake, you're going out and making a circle somewhere and learning, you know, play or if you're. Ah, yeah, we do that at night. We have campfires. <laughs> we come out and we bring the instruments, and people like the Murphys will we'll get some music going, and the rest of us get to enjoy it. Okay, um, if there's no more questions, <coughs> excuse me. We'll get close to wrapping this up. We're going to hear from the Murphys again. As I said, they've been coming for years and years. And um, it's, it's fabulous to have them. I don't, Cosmo thought she might drop in, but it doesn't look like it. So one thing that uh, happens at Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp also, now this isn't why you would come, but the MC often uh, tries to provide a little entertainment between musical acts. So while the Murphys get ready here, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, I've been listening to his jokes for years and years, and I've, I've picked them up perhaps because I'm the MC, but uh, there's a segment in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in the last movement where the bass players have nothing to play uh, for about 20 minutes. So one night they're in the Philharmonic uh, playing the uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and they get to this segment of 20 minutes of no notes to play and the head of the bass section gestures and, and leads his players out the back door and across the alley into the bar. And they're having a beer. And then one of them looks at his watch and he says, oh, we're, we're almost out of time. We gotta get back on stage. And the section leader says, well, well, don't worry. I thought that could happen. So I tied up the score. And so they stumble across the alley and they stagger back into the back of the stage and get ready to start playing again. And someone in the audience, uh, looks and nudges her companion and says, look, the conductor looks pretty, uh, pretty agitated right now. And her companion says, well, you can see why. It's the bottom of the ninth, the score is tied, and the bases are loaded. <laughs> <laughs> the Murphys. <laughs> I just wanted to, to make one comment. Mark, Mark said when he heard about Fiddle Camp that his uh, first impression was, what are you crazy? I'd take a week out of my life to do that. And I had the same reaction when my wife told me about it. <laughs> like, this, this is insane. And about two days, it took me about two days to get hooked on it. We've been coming every year since then, so it's a lot of fun. Definitely. This is called Dusty Miller, by the way. <laughs>
Well, that is a great family playing great music. So I thank you, the Morphys, very much. Thank you, Mr. Mark Luther, for sharing your your views, your experiences on how music has uh, helped you raise your family. I really thank you for that. And uh, well, maybe we're going to uh, fill up a bus next year and head to Colorado. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, being in this uh, pre-concert lecture, and we have about 15 minutes to take our seats and enjoy oh, tonight's one performance. Oh, thing, I was just chatting, they, they play locally. Did, they, did you announce that? I missed, did I walk away and miss, did you already say that? The Murphys play locally. They do, that's what they uh, do. Maybe we want to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you asked, we'll right. yeah. <laughs> we'll be at, uh, we play at Me and Edge Pizza in Lakewood. Okay. And about once every two months, we play at Me and Edge Pizza in Lakewood. So we're going to be there on July 7th, if you're, you know, if you're in the area and you want to come see us. We have a whole band. We have a banjo and a dobro and a bass and kids and Anybody so. email me the information and then email us? Yeah, anybody else who's interested, if, if you want, I can put you on the email list. And we do, we, we do this for like two hours. There's no cover. Uh, best pizza in Lakewood. <laughs> <laughs> best pizza in the South Bay. And, uh, and you know, if you come, they'll pay a cover charge and uh, play music for a couple hours. So. We're going to post all of this information on our website and on the uh, next to the video about uh, Rocky Mountain uh, Fiddle Camp and about the Murphys and about the place in the pizza place in Lakewood where we can go pizza and uh, hear the pepperoni pizza on the violin. Huh? <laughs> Thank you.